Good morning, everyone. Welcome to another fantastic brunch from our Healthcare Maintenance and IBD series. This series is supported by educational grants from Janssen, Pfizer, and Takeda. I'm Dr. Ali Sharabadi. I'm an assistant clinical director of the Division of Gastroenterology at Johns Hopkins School of Medicine and the founder of Monday Night IBD. I am delighted to be joined today by my colleague and very good friend, Dr. Jamie Knuken. She's a senior associate consultant at the Division of Gastroenterology and Hepatology at the Mayo Clinic. Jamie, welcome. Thank you for being with us this morning. Thanks. Thanks, Eileen and Monday Night IBD for having me. I'm so excited to be here and in this platform and this webinar format is just such an excellent way that we can kind of talk with each other, not only as professionals, but also to engage our patients in the discussions too. So thank you for having me. Absolutely. We're very excited. Our faculty disclosures are on the screen. In today's discussion, we are going to address the healthcare maintenance in some of the special populations living with inflammatory bowel disease. Uh, Jamie, IBD is a challenging disease. We know that. It's a challenging disease to manage and to live with. And there are some additional challenges or some particular challenges uh, that are amplified in some specific population. So I was thinking maybe we can talk today about what particular or additional care people living with IBD have when they are young, adolescent, or when they are pregnant and in the post-pregnancy period, and when they are above age 60. I don't like to use the word elderly because <laughs> uh, that is a moving target that we're all heading to. So for people above age 60. So maybe we can start with the pediatric and adolescent population living with IBD. Um, Jamie, what additional challenges and what additional care this population have? There is a very unique opportunity for us to partner with our pediatric colleagues in that transition phase. So when we, when I think maybe we talk more a little bit about adolescence, which we are starting to see more of, and on the adult side, you know, we know that there's there is at least a quarter quarter of the population um, with IBD that are diagnosed under the age of 18. So it is not you know a small percentage, um, and I think they pose unique challenges in several ways. One, we know that bone and you know and growth and development all happen majority of it before age 18. And so those are incredibly important considerations that are very different than when we see our patients that are in their late 20s or in their 30s or, or even when they, when they um, you know, are over the age of 60, those challenges are very different. Um, so obviously bone health is, is top priority. Um, we need to avoid steroid containing therapies in all of our patients, but especially in our younger patients whose bones are are still growing. Um, and if we are using steroids, which sometimes we need to, we need to make sure that we're monitoring that. So not only monitoring their growth to understand when they fall off the growth curve, um, when they reach you know, more of the 17 to 18, if they've been exposed to steroids, making sure that we've had bone health assessment. That includes vitamin D assessment, but also having them do a bone scan or a DEXA scan um, so that we have this baseline assessment. Then again, if they do have early bone loss to partner with a pediatric endocrinologist or some Somebody that works with you know adolescents and or young adults in that age. Other things is, is doing nutritional evaluations. Um, you know I think that um, children are resilient and adolescents are resilient, but then they also are much more affected by having chronic daily abdominal symptoms um, and the impact that that might have, or having parents who've taken over a lot of um, the management of their disease and the care of, of of what they're doing, and so they may they may not be as um, you know, involved in, in the care uh, that you're providing. Um, so that I think leads me to sort of the psychosocial aspect that is more unique to the adolescents. I think it's important that we address um, psychosocial, including anxiety and depression in all of our patients, but in particular for our, our growing um, young adults and adolescents who, you know, with COVID-19 that increased the amount of social isolation that these, these patients had. And, and for somebody with a diarrheal illness, that actually may have been a, a positive uh, in a way where they didn't have to figure out where the bathroom was or be in school, but it also meant that they weren't interacting or, or having those, those daily interactions with peers and friends. Um, depression and anxiety are prevalent throughout IBD, but in, in our younger patients, we have to recognize that, you know, up to 40, 50% of them may have a co-diagnosis or even undiagnosed anxiety or depression. So I think the take home is if we don't ask, we don't know about it. Um, and if we start asking the right questions to our, our younger patients, we'll start to get some more answers. 
And I, you know, I think that some of the healthcare more challenges in the pediatric population outside of, of you know, assessment of bone health and their growth and their nutrition, as well as their, their mental health, is also considering some of the challenges that we have when we treat younger patients with compliance or adherence to therapies. Um, so if mom is there every day or dad is there every day or, you know, wherever, whoever's parenting is there every day reminding them, that may be different. But as they start to transition into those years where they are more independent, they're 16 and older, they're driving, they get their own medications from the pharmacy, now they're going to college. Some of those things that may be really well controlled when they were a little bit younger um, may be uh, come into play as they reach sort of this adolescent um, phase. Um, so therapy and, and compliance or adherence to therapies um, and then I, I think that one thing that's unique, um, although I, I often see that um, my patients are lucky to have a support figure who comes with them to visits, more often than not, when you're treating adolescent or young adult patients, they're more likely to bring that family member. And so you don't just have one patient, you often have, um, you know, several patients in the room because now you have the parents and, and they have lots of questions and often really great questions, um, but you may be fielding questions from multiple multiple angles with some of our transition patients. At least that's been my experience, but always well welcomed and, and the more opportunity to provide patient and, and family-based education is always great. This is amazing, Jamie, Jamie, and I know we have similar experience, you know, as adult GI, uh, it's true we don't treat pediatric population, but we might be treating adolescent and often in certain areas of the country, we're the only one available uh, to uh, these patients and their families. There, there's not always an access to a pizza gastroenterologist in some areas of the country, so we do have to become uh, more comfortable taking care of adolescent. And like you said, uh, I, I feel there's two, two, you know, in our communication with our patients, we are communicating with the patient and the family member. And uh, actually, we do need the family member supports in terms of compliance. And the patient is relying on their family member, right, for transportation, following up on tests, et cetera. But also, it is uh, part of what we need to do is to help our patient become independent progressively, right, and be able to understand uh, their care, understand their disease, and understand how to communicate with us. But I'm really happy that you touch upon the psychosocial issue. Like you said, this is a big theme in uh, people living with chronic illnesses, including IBD. And I cannot imagine how much it touch um, or, or, or illness like IBD affect uh, people uh, during the adolescence. This is a time of hormonal, physical, emotional changes. This is a time where um, you know, I, I have a teenager and I have two teenagers at home and I know all they want to do is be independent of me and they want to be with their friends and fit in. So, you know, having a disease like IBD where you have to rely on your parents to take you for a visit, where you have to maybe shy away from certain social activity with your friends or maybe not be able to confound in them with what, why you're missing school, why you're having these tests done, it can be very taxing emotionally. So um, I'm glad you addressed uh, the, the mental health issue. This is something that we need to address, that we need to ask our patient and really building the trust with a teenager uh, is key uh, for them to you know, op be open to that conversation and for us to be able to uh, gear them in the right direction in terms of psychological care. When you bring up something really, you know, interesting, and I didn't even touch on it, and, and you, you know, thinking about those teenage years, I mean, you think about puberty, you think about body image, right? Like, that's where all of those things are being formed. You know, I think that we as a profession do a terrible job about talking about sexuality, right? None of us are probably well trained in having these conversations, which at times can be uncomfortable. Um, but I imagine in these young adults and adolescent phase, it's even even more challenging to to have these conversations and and to ask how how this is impacting them as a young adult and you know in their development or in their sexuality and and dating and things like that so I, I think there's an opportunity a unique opportunity within this group as well as we should be talking about this with all of our patients you know bef before what we're going to talk about next which is pregnancy um, but also making sure that they aren't getting pregnant you know um, with active disease absolutely i think as um you know already as um, a GI taking care of IBD patient, I think we're like internists and OBGYN and endocrinologists at the same time, but probably even more so in the peds adolescent population. But we're gonna shift gear now and talk about the time of pregnancy, preconception, pregnancy, postpartum. Uh, I know you, we both have kids and I don't know if you had as much anxiety as I did when I was pregnant, making sure I'm healthy, I'm healthy for the baby and the baby's healthy. And I had horrible heartburn and I was so hesitant 
hesitant to take a PPI, you know, I research which PPI is safe. So I can only imagine again, uh, you know, for, for young women and women uh, uh, wishing to get pregnant, uh, the many thoughts that cross their mind, you know, is this is, is pregnancy safe if I have an inflammatory bowel disease? Are my medication safe? Is my baby going to be okay? So uh, what can we tell our patients? I think what the most important thing is, is that this is, and I think when we think about pregnancy and fertility and stuff like that, we think of our female patients, right? But that's, I think, I think that's where um, we have an opportunity to kind of change other providers way that they approach patients. Um, I think about this with all of my patients, whether they're, they're, you know, female or male, because um, just as that male patient may not be the person getting pregnant in front of me, um, their significant other might be wanting to get pregnant. And so just asking what family planning goals are, even at the first visit, are you in a relationship? Are you currently sexually active? Um, you know, uh, do you have plans to, to have a family? Um, because I think that those are really important discussions, um, even with men, because again, there's some of the therapies that we use that we do recommend. Um, it's not absolute, but within, within men, we try to get them off of methotrexate at least three months. And so that's something that you'd have to ask about to be able to have that conversation. Um, but so, yeah, I kind of think about sort of these childbearing years. So moving on out of adolescence and and um, you know, young adults in, in this age of like preconception counseling and planning and how, how do we make sure that you're the best um, state that you can possibly be to have the healthiest pregnancy and the healthiest baby, which I know is a goal for, for you know, all um, future moms out there. Um, and um, then you know, obviously in the pregnancy, for in the preconception, really I, I talk about the same things I talk about at a regular visit. Um, how are you feeling? Is your disease in remission? Not only how are you feeling, but how, when was the last time we looked at your disease? When was your last colonoscopy or imaging evaluation? Are your medicines working for you? Are you on the right medicines for your disease? So if you do have active disease, do we need to make some titrations to those medications? In an ideal world, we'd like to see patients. I, you know, I know that the guidance out there is three months, but I really like to see my patients in a steroid-free remission for at least six months with a recent objective evaluation that really says, yes, you are good to go and that you are gonna have potentially the best outcome with this pregnancy. When we start the conversation of family planning, I tell patients they need to start their prenatal vitamin and start supplementing with folic acid and always remind, remembering those patients on sulfasalazine to give them extra folic acid because it works through that pathway of depletion. And then, you know, I, I do counsel my patients, even my younger patients um, that normally wouldn't need to see a fertility specialist. I think in IBD patients, if they have been having unprotected intercourse for at least six months and have not had a successful pregnancy, um, that I get them involved with my infertility um, team or my fertility specialist right away. Because I, I think that there's, um, we sometimes have these windows, right? That they're in remission right now, but they may not be in remission a year from now. And so I don't want to see them continue to struggle. And there's also, I think, some factors that are really important to consider that are maybe unique to IBD patients that the general population doesn't experience as risk factors for, for infertility or fertility-related issues. And then, of course, this is always the time to make sure that they're up to date on all their health maintenance before they, you know, have, have um, you know, intrauterine pregnancy so that we can really, um, you know, get the screenings that we need to get, um, do, you know, bone scans if we need to, because that can't be done during pregnancy. Um, obviously, surveillance colonoscopies, we, we avoid at all costs, um, not that they're completely unsafe, but we certainly wouldn't do an elective surveillance exam during pregnancy, um, making sure vaccinations are up to date, although all of our vaccinations are safe in pregnancy. It's really great if we start to build that immunity um, up prior to um, our patients getting pregnant. Um, and I think one of the things that, you know, often gets missed in many visits is making sure that we have some sort of nutrition assessment, uh, because certainly malnutrition during pregnancy is, is a high risk for um, preterm labor and preterm birth. And, and you know, worse outcomes for mom and baby. So I think that's really how I approached my pregnant patients, but I'd love to hear if, if you kind of think about pregnancy a little bit differently. Yeah, absolutely. I think you and I have uh, same same uh, way of practicing and same thoughts. This is something I address with my patient. I always ask them, what is your, you know, what are your plans? And I always say, well, this conversation, we need to have a conversation. Not only, it, it doesn't only happen between you and your partner, but I have to be included in this. I'm like the medical mother-in-law or something. <laughs> and, 
And I think the more we talk about this and earlier, the better, because the last thing you want to do is uh, have that phone call where the patient stopped their medication because they found that they were pregnant or they went to the OBGYN who looked up, you know, maybe outdated literature and said, you know, you need to stop the isotherapin, you need to stop this and that. So we don't want to get to this point. So absolutely, we need to be proactive into uh, for the pregnancy uh, counseling and really um, reassure uh, in terms of the safety of the medication, the important goals that we have during pregnancy and before pregnancy, which is like you said, making sure the disease is under good control way before pregnancy, steroid-free remission, and keeping that disease, that, that disease and remission during pregnancy to optimize mom's health and, um, and baby's health. And I agree with you uh, that um, you know the disease and remission is not only the colon being healthy, but your nutrition status, your medication optimized. You know, if you need supplementation of folic acid because you're on sofasalazine, that we provide that, the vaccination, et cetera. So it's more than just the GI uh, track that we're looking at. We're really looking at optimizing all the conditions before heading into this pregnancy. And I agree, we have to think about potential infertility in our patients with IBD, especially those who've had surgery, who had a pouch uh, uh, and a colectomy for UC, but also in our Crohn's patients who've had resections and maybe pelvic abscesses or, um, you know, other potential for adhesion in that area. So low threshold to uh, reach out to fertility specialists if the, that pregnancy is not happening uh, quickly enough. Yeah, no, and I think that, um, you know, one of the, the, the things that I talk about before pregnancy is that, you know, the best pregnancy is the planned pregnancy, um, right? Because there's a lot less variables, um, but there, we do have patients that have unexpected pregnancies and, and we manage those and uh, all the same things apply. Um, but for IBD patients, I truly think that planned pregnancies are really where we see the best outcomes um, because we're able to control for a lot of these factors. Those are all very important, dis you know, discussions to have up front. Um, but you're right. The most important thing is to remind our patients that they got into remission mission and that's safe for pregnant or that's the ideal part for pregnancy but then they have to continue those medications throughout pregnancy so that they can continue to stay well and and that patients will relapse if they stop their therapies and and that could lead to some you know challenges for both mom and baby absolutely so moving to later in life i'm gonna call it later in life <laughs> Uh, you know, I, I think that the disease burden in the elderly can be really amplified uh, because as an older patient, we already have other medical problems, um, our mobility, our social support, all kinds of other things that are really important in managing IBD can be suboptimal. So, uh, Jamie, how do you approach your older patients with IBD? What are, the, what are our goals of care and what kind of therapy can we offer and how do you monitor this patient population? At every start of every visit, I ask a patient and their caregiver or their family member what their, if we could pick top three goals for that visit. Like what were the things that they would want to accomplish in that visit? And it's amazing how it's ver so variable across, you know, the things that you think that people would say and what they say are so different, which I think is really telling to, if I didn't ask that question, I sort of have like my mindset, like we're going to review your labs. We're going to make sure your disease is in remission. We're going to do all these things on my checklist, but it really is important to address what the patient's checklist is. And I think it's even more important in this population uh, because um, I think that the answers would, would really surprise some providers out there. If you ask patients, you know, sort of what their, what their goals are um, and what they, you know, what they hope, you know, why, why is remission important to them? I think about infections in my in my um, older pop, uh, patients um, and their increased rate and at baseline to have infections. And then if we add certain medical therapies on top of that, um, we certainly can increase some some infectious complications, which we know are preventable by vaccination. So I think in this group, we, you know, we really kind of focus on on some of those you know high yield vaccinations, um, herpes zoster vaccination, the, the non live recombinant herpes zoster vaccination. Um, pneumococcal vaccinations um, in these patients and really the importance of influenza vaccination annually. And then now with COVID-19 vaccination, you know, really making sure that at every visit that they don't need a booster of, of any of, of the vaccines and that they're up to date um, so that we can prevent those in, in potential infectious complications. Um, I think that the other challenges um, is just as much with our pediatric population now on the other side is um, really addressing anxiety and depression and making sure to ask the validated questions that surround that because um, I suspect that it's it's probably less diagnosed in these in these older 
patients than it is um, even in the younger patients. Yeah, I agree with you. And, and, and I really um, love the fact that you made the point of asking the patient, what are their goals of care, right? And in the elderly population, it's often like, I want to be able to travel to see my grandkids. I want to be able to enjoy my retirement and go to the golf course. So our goals of care um, it is more quality of life, right? Balancing the control of the symptoms with adequate therapies and uh, minimizing the risk of infection that our older patients are, you know, at higher risk of infection. And keeping in mind that, you know, of all the therapies we have, even though we have limited data, it's a steroid that drives the higher risk of infection in the elderly, like in everybody else. And probably the side effect of steroid are also amplified in the elderly. No, it's, I, I think back to one of uh, a patient that I, I recently had that their their goal was to, um, they'd been waiting through the pandemic to travel to one of the seven wonders of the world. Um, and the only way that, that they could get there was to be taking steroids, right? And so sometimes our goals of steroid-free remission to do those things um, don't necessarily meet the goals of what the patient needs. And I think at the, these later stages in life, um, sometimes taking on some small risk for some you know, incredible, invaluable benefit of being able to travel and, and see your grandkids, go to your, you know, grandkids wedding, things like that. Um, you know, I think it's everything, you know, has to be weighed against what that patient's goals are. Yeah. Well, this is a great example of patient-centered care, right? We have the science, yeah. we have the data, but then you have the patient in front of you with all their, you know, uh, components. How do, how do I get, yeah. how do I get yeah. there? Yeah. How do I get there? <laughs> right. The right. medicine's going to take six months to work and I need to go right. on this trip like in two weeks. I agree. So, you know, how do I get there? So yeah, I think it's, I think the most important thing is just assessing in all of these situations, whether it's adolescence, the pre-pregnant patient, the pregnant patient, the patient after pregnancy, and then, you know, throughout stages of life, we, I guess, are given this great honor to be able to care for patients throughout their stages of life. And um, while each stage poses its own challenges sometimes in care, um, I think if we just bring it back to the patient and what their goals are, and they may change year to year. Um, and so uh, you, you you can't be wrong in that. So maybe that should be one of the new healthcare maintenance, you know, first thing on the checklist is like, what is your goal in the next year? I love it. <laughs> I love it. You are absolutely right. We're right on point. The goals, goals change, our goals of care change, our goals for our life change, our goals of, you know, disease control change. And I think that is, um, like you said, this is a you know, the privilege of taking care of patients with IBD is that we are with them in that journey and learning what are their priorities and what kind of life event they're going through and how we can adjust our therapy or approach uh, to optimize uh, their life and quality of life and their health is absolutely key. So I think I, I don't have anything more to add to what you just said. It was just perfect. True patient-centered care. <laughs> Yeah. Jamie, thank you so this much. This was so fun. Yeah, this was a great way to spend the morning with you. I really appreciate your time and your expertise, but also most importantly, I appreciate, you know, I could see the passion and the heart that you put in this and how you are thinking about what's best for our, our patients at different stage of their lives. And this conversation has been just absolutely amazing. So thank you for your time. And thank you for everyone for joining us today. Don't forget to check our healthcare maintenance and IBD for special population tutorial that was posted under the Monday Night IBD hashtag. And please make sure to claim your CME credit by completing the post test and the evaluation from the link. Have a great day, everyone.